Uh, good evening. I'm Denise Bennetts. I'm chair of Article 25, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening and to Roisin Hinehan, who has kindly agreed to talk to us about the Grand Egyptian Museum. I know many of you will be familiar with Article 25, but for those who may not be, we're an architecture charity based in London, using design to improve health, livelihood and resilience to disasters. We're named after and driven by Article 25 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states that everyone has the right to adequate and dignified shelter. Our vision is of a world where all communities have access to better housing, safe school buildings and effective clinics and hospitals, and we provide the design skills and knowledge needed to make this a reality. We've worked on more than 90 projects in 34 countries, making us the most far-reaching architectural NGO in the world. Our projects are, of course, delivered with in-country partners to ensure that local knowledge and relationships are maximised, that projects are sustainable and communities resilient well after our involvement has ended. We will tell you more about our projects and how you may consider supporting us later. Our guest this evening is Roisin Hinahan, an architect who studied for her Bachelor of Architecture degree at University College Dublin, and then for her Masters at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. It was there that she met Shifu Peng, and whilst working in New York, they started collaborating on ideas competitions before founding Hinahan Peng in 1999. Early success in ideas competition was followed in 2001 by winning the bid for Kildare County Council's civic office, which prompted their relocation to Dublin. Since then, the practice has developed a diverse and acclaimed portfolio, working with landscape and urban planning, as well as architecture. Their built work includes the Giants Causeway Visitor Centre in Northern Ireland, the Library and School of Architecture for the University of Greenwich in London, both shortlisted for the Sterling Prize and for the EU Mies van der Rohe Award, the Palestinian Museum in Birzit, and the National Gallery of Ireland Historic Wings refurbishment. Current projects include the Book of Kells Visitor Centre at Trinity College Dublin, the Canadian Canoe Museum in Ontario, and amongst a number of German projects, the Botanical Gardens Visitor Centre in Berlin, where the practice now has a second office. This is just a selection of their projects and competition wins. And as an architect myself, I appreciate that the range and quality of their work is incredible. And I'm very, very impressed. Ina Heng Peng has exhibited and published widely, including multiple participations at the Venice Biennale, as well as her practice commitments. Rasheen has also taught extensively, was recently at Yale University, lectured widely, and served as a jury member on several international architectural competitions and awards, including the Sterling Prize in 2016. We asked Roisin to focus this evening's talk on the Grand Egyptian Museum at Giza, which Hina Heng Pen won in 2003 as a result of an open architectural competition, which attracted 1,557 entries from 83 countries. This win would have been a memorable achievement for any practice, but for the commission to be awarded to a young emerging one was exceptional. Now, 18 years later, we look forward to the opening of the museum and travel restrictions permitting the opportunity to experience and understand the relationship between the collection, the building, the unique location, and to appreciate the conceptual principles which won the competition and have guided design since. Before handing over to Rasheen, please note that the lecture is being recorded and you're invited to post questions using the chat function for David Murray, Article 25's MD, to raise after the talk. Please also post on social media. Rusheen, over to you. Thank you very much, Denise, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so, um, as Denise mentioned, this was uh, an open competition. Um, it was um, it was an ideas to start with an, uh, an ideas competition and then it shortlisted down to 20. And when I was pulling together um, uh, work for this, this talk, I realized that there were certain key themes or certain, yeah, ideas that were instrumental when we were doing the competition and really guided the work over the years. And that's really what I want to talk about today. So I hope this works. So I suppose the first one that was 
is really kind of encapsulated in this image, which was a very grainy photograph of the pyramids that uh, I found on the internet back in 2002. And I had been to Egypt, but Shifu had not. Uh, we, we didn't go to the site initially because, you know, it was a huge open competition. Uh, but what really struck us about this image was you can see, first of all, how close Cairo gets to the pyramids. Um, you know, the, the photos of the pyramids are normally taken from the other side where you see it uh, surrounded by desert. But you also see the silhouette of the pyramids on the skyline. So our site was two kilometers from the pyramids. And it's a very, very large, very important museum. But yet we're kind of building in this shadow. So the question really was, how do you how do you build so close uh, to the pyramids? Um, so coming back to Egypt, and when we later on won the competition, one of the things that we kept being told was, oh, you know, you Westerners, you're so obsessed with the desert, but really. Egypt was the space of the Nile Valley, and you can see there the Nile as it carves through the desert on its way to the sea and then opens up to the sea. And of course, that contrast, that or that that landscape is is really present in Egypt. You can see the the verdant Nile as it comes right up against the desert. You can see where it's cut through the desert. And our site was right at that point. It was right where the Nile Valley met the desert. And there's actually a 50 meter difference in level across the site. So we we're very, very, uh, very, very close to the pyramids. So we decided from a very early point that the museum should not go above the level of the desert. Uh, the, per the pyramids are built in the desert because, uh, well, our understanding was they were funerary, so they were in the desert. That was the space of death. Uh, so we weren't going to go above the level of the desert, but we took a line from the pyramids back to our site, and that became the front face of the museum, and then unfold that so that the museum, if you like, was was built around the view from the site uh, to the pyramids, and the museum occupies the space within that view line. And and in, in sectionally as well, that kind of that opening up to the museum was put in place, so it kind of slopes back down from that line drawn from the top of the pyramids back to the site. Um, the second, the second uh, obsession in a way came about after we won the competition. And we had, we had a steep learning curve in terms of um, Egyptian culture and Egyptology. And uh, as we built the team, um, we were taken around the Egyptian museum by an Egyptologist, and he picked out what he considered some really key pieces. And one of them was this measuring rod, which really struck us. And what, what he kind of uh, talked to us about was that what this really spoke to was the st structures that the Egyptians had put in place to uh, to have equivalence across weight that allowed them to implement systems of taxation that allowed a system of bureaucracy to be put in place and ultimately if you like the state structures that allowed these really um, uh, this very developed society and and allowed these major um, structures like the pyramids so it was kind of allowed that state organization to occur um, but I suppose what we took away from it in, in some ways was that kind of system of measurement. Um, and then kind of in parallel with that, an element of the brief was um, the Nile Valley, or the, sorry, the Nile Park. So we kind of thought of, uh, of the Nile as this infrastructural element, you know, it was the, the transportation through Egypt. But if you like, in our imagining on this large 50 hectare site, 
it's also this infrastructure that kind of cuts across the site to organize different activities. There's landscape, there's water, there's exhibition. So if you like, we took this line and then we unfolded it across the site and it starts to structure another reading of the site. So if you like, the, there's this very kind of linear reading, which is that view towards the pyramids, and that's where the Egyptology, or that's where the, the main collections are housed. But then there's this other reading across the site that kind of creates this landscape, and this may be an alternative way of navigating. Um, and it, the, the, the landscape was also an important part of the design because it is a 50 hectare site. It's, it's a large site on the western side of Cairo. So we, uh, we in general, we followed the logic of the Nile where, where we have this lower plateau, this Nile Valley, that becomes the greenest part of the site. But then there's one displaced element that's put up onto the upper plateau and this becomes um, Lands of Egypt Garden, where there's a recreation, if you like, of that landscape of Egypt to try to tell a story of how the wealth of Egypt came about. Because so much of what's left in the collection came from tombs that, in a way, sometimes Egypt it gets associated in some ways with death. But of, of course, it was kind of the, the life and, and the wealth of the landscape of Egypt that allowed so much of this culture to exist. And we wanted somehow to communicate that in this, this garden. And I should say that we worked on the landscape with West Ace. Um, so here you can see some study models. You can see that large difference in level across the site and, and, and how this kind of uh, Nile Park structures the site. Um, a, um, a more developed model, uh, the roof taken off the building, but you can see how it kind of courses across the site. And of course, this is the main um, museum that's facing towards the pyramid. Here you can see that lower plateau. This is the Nile Valley and then the desert up here. And then with the roof kind of, uh, if you like, providing that dominant reading towards the pyramid. So the pyramids are here to the south. Um, then a third theme for us was the narrative of the building. How were visitors going to experience this? We were aware that um, this is designed to accommodate 6 million visitors a year, but we know a lot of people that come are foreigners who spend maybe uh, two, three hours in the museum. And, you know, it, how, how, what's that experience? We thought it was quite important that you don't just walk through a door and suddenly you're back in ancient Egypt. So, so that there's a sequence from when you get off the bus or where you get dropped off your taxi that kind of prepares you to actually enter this space. So um, there's this monumental courtyard when you get off the bus and you go through the whole security, you come into the sunken space that slopes up. Uh, there are gardens here on either side, but it kind of leads you up to this monumental facade. And you pass through the facade and you're still in an outside space. It's shaded, it's a little bit cooler, uh, but it's still an exterior space. Um, and it's in this space that the uh, statue of Ramses II that was in Tahrir Square is now located. To the right is the, uh, sorry, the conference center and the museum is on the other side. So you can see here, this is that entrance space. It's actually designed to be an outside space. I'm not sure if it was fully built that way. There's a conference center. Here you can see again, the Nile Valley, the, muse the pyramids are here to the south and there's the, the museum. Now, one of the things that we needed to na navigate was that we wanted visitors to see the pyramids when they were in the exhibition space, but the pyramids were up at the desert level, whereas our entrance is from the Nile Valley level. So visitors have to navigate a 20 meter difference in level. So 
we wanted to make it as simple as possible, as intuitive as possible, but also use that level difference in a way as part of that visitor experience. So this stair here becomes, oops, sorry, this stair here becomes this grand staircase, we called it the, the I think the, the pharaohs, uh, you start at the bottom and there's, it becomes a display uh, space for statues of uh, starting with Cleopatra, which is uh, one of the more recent. And then as you go ascend the stairs, you move backwards in time. There is a, a travelator there to allow people to more easily ascend. There's also, of course, lifts provided. So the stairs is designed with fairly slow movement up the stair. So quite a monumental rise until you get to the end. And it's here you see the pyramids for the first time inside the museum. So now you're back at the old kingdom. So you're back much uh, closer to the beginning of the story. Um, we designed the permanent exhibition galleries to be more or less on one level. I thought it was important that visitors have a sense of the scale of the civilization. One of the things that kind of always struck us was that 4,000 years of Egyptian civilization, which is like twice the period uh, post-Christianity, to somehow convey this in, in some way physically for visitors that you actually could somehow just experience this scale. Um, of course, the, the galleries are stepping in some ways because the building overall is stepping up. So there are what we called trays, uh, four trays, um, one and a half meter level difference between them. Um, and so you're starting here at um, at the old kingdom, and then if you like, you move forward in time again uh, with these uh, transition zones in our narrative as the intermediate uh, periods, which were transitional periods um, and quite disruptive in in, in terms of uh, also what was produced at that time. So you can see these these um, steps become these. Um, these intermediate periods where you're stepping from one, one time to another. The galleries are designed to the ability to be primarily naturally daylit because, of course, a lot of the pieces are stone. Um, and, and you can see here as well the way that that unfolding, if you like, of the, the plan, uh, south is to the bottom of the screen, the pyramids are to the bottom. Here was that big a uh, line that was created to the pyramids, it got unfolded. And those blue zones there are the structural lines. They also contain all the services. So there's no interruption, if you like, between the unfolding of the fan so that you actually feel that unfolding. So you can see these big structural walls and then within them are housed all of the fire escape stairs, all of the supporting services. And then this is some of those intermediate periods. Um, I suppose supporting that kind of narrative of kind of gradually moving in, gradually being brought into the museum was how we dealt with it environmentally. And we wanted, um, you know, that idea of layering to be part of the environment. Um, it was important that as much as possible, the museum work whereby um, there's a uh, you know, as much space as possible that can be outdoors is outside, and then you gradually move into increasing levels of control. So the courtyard was naturally uh, controlled, just shaded with some water to take down temperature. Then as you ascend the stair, you have some soft air conditioning, which is using uh, some of the the um, air from the galleries. The galleries are conditioned, but they're not as closely conditioned because there's quite a lot of stone. And then gradually where we need microclimate generators, they're provided for the really uh, sensitive elements and, and there's the ability to control daylight. So it's kind of gradually moving in, also not to leave uh, a burden of a very, um, uh, expensive museum to uh, maintain. So you can he see here the way that the stair was designed. There are screens which keep some of the cooler air here that's rejected at the top of the stair that allow that cooler air to be where visitors are. But there isn't actually a door 
until you get up to the top of the stairs, up until the permanent exhibition galleries, or uh, you enter into the permanent exhibition galleries. It's just trying to use air movement to control the heat. Um, there's also um, this idea of a screen outside the building with um, a very heavy weight, simple concrete box. And then if you like, the um, the elements that are special are actually screens that are kind of set off a little bit from the structure. And the, then I suppose the fifth element that was that stayed with us was use of stone. Um, stone was really important in, in Egyptian architecture, but we we were also interested in the fact that this facade uh, was creating this new cliff face, if you like, it was creating this new line between the desert and the Nile Valley. Um, and there was a kind of another thought uh, about the um, the way that life, that if in Egypt, uh, nightlife is so vibrant that there is this change from day to night. So we wanted the building in some way to reflect that. So the stone that, that uh, we used was an onyx, so during the day it's fairly quiet, looks like stone, but then has the ability at night to be backlit lit and somehow to to glow. Um, it is a very, very big uh, stone facade. Uh, that is a drawing there with it um, in proportion to the Seattle Library. It's quite long, so it's a lot of stone. Um, and we needed to find a way to, um, I suppose, to rationalize it, to make it as achievable as possible. So we used a triangular structure because it set off the concrete, the, the main building. Uh, so to try to have it as, um, what's the word, to try to have it as stable as possible, and then started to divide it using a Sierpinski gasket. So dividing all the halfway points. And that, what that gave us, oops, sorry, what that gave us was for each triangle, we had the exact same size of stone. So overall, we used 17 different sizes of stone for the entire facade, which gave us a lot of efficiency in terms of the, uh, the cutting of the stone. Um, and then what you're seeing here is the longer the steel member which was supporting that, the thicker it was. So as the steel became shorter, it became thinner, so we set it back. So we got some depth into the structure so that it somehow communicated the, the structural principles behind it, but also gave a pattern to the facade. However, unfortunately, that stone facade is not being built. Um, during the construction, it was decided um, to go with a kind of a, 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 a glass facade. So that's actually what's in place right now. So this element did not get built. Um, these are some photos of the museum um, under construction. Uh, so you can see here these folding concrete roofs. You can see these big stone walls that are supporting the services. Some of these really large spans, 40 meters there. You can see here as well, you know, the way it's set back in from the desert, those large uh, retaining walls. Um, this, um, the, the Ramses was brought into the museum fairly early on actually, and they built the museum around it. Um, the, it's interesting that the steel facade was built um, not completely, uh, maybe according to the design principles. So there are elements of the, the original facade that, that have been built, but here you can see that large courtyard space. Um, the museum is here to the right, the conservation, or sorry, the conference center to the left. There is another view uh, from inside. Um, this is was taken, I think, about maybe a year, 18 months ago, at the top of the stairs. So looking down the stairs, there is the uh, travelator there. Um, a view of the roof. Um, I just happen to like seeing the pyramids. 
popping over the museum. So this is uh, taken from the pyramids. You can see how it's got quite a low profile from this view. So it's just there. You can see the galleries uh, as they as they're looking towards the pyramids. You can see it's quite low, but on this side, on the uh, eastern side, you have that big uh, 50 meter facade. Uh, some more recent photos within the galleries getting a bit finished. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I always find looking at people here because it kind of gives a sense of the scale. But again, you can see these big uh, walls where the services are located um, designed with north light. Um, some of the um, the statues of the pharaohs being brought into place uh, on the stairs. You can see there the travelator is there to the right. And then these are much more recent photos. Um, uh, this is in the far uh, Western galleries. Uh, so there's Tutankhamun, the, the gold mask is someplace in around here. So these galleries, they decided to um, to close down all the daylight because of the, the collection that's here, which was an element in the design. We always factored in that daylight could be closed out in some of the galleries. Uh, but here you can see some of the stairs. And actually, um, that's it. We finish on Tutankhamun. Thank you, Rusheen. That's a truly astonishing project. Um, 18 years is a very, very long time. And clearly there's been major political changes during that time. And I think you were saying that you probably haven't really been in, involved directly in the, the realization of the project over the last eight, 10 years, is that correct? Yes, so the we finished a lot of our work in, um, 2008, 2009 maybe. Um, then there was a little bit of a, a pause. Um, and of course, then there was the Arab Spring a bit later. So there was a lot of change in Egypt. In 2012, the contract was signed. And at that point, there was a very different team on the side, on the Egyptian side. So for a while we were involved, um, but had a very, very minimal role in the project. And then eventually, um, eventually, uh, you know, we, we our inv involvement really uh, became next to nothing from about 2014 on. Which I think that's one of those terrible kind of conundrums of, of the, the architect, especially working in other countries that you can take a project to a certain stage and then you have to hope that the information and the concept is sufficiently robust that actually the, the fundamental principles are, are carried through. And I think having looked at those photographs, um, you know, the fundamental concept that won the competition has actually stood up to the, the changes and the iterations that the design has gone through um, and hopefully will still be a, a fantastic experience although I do wish I could have seen the, the onyx wall glowing at the time. <laughs> um, I, I could ask lots and lots of, of architectural questions, um, but there are a whole series of, of questions which are coming in on the chat function. So can I hand over to, to David um, to start asking those questions? Thank you, Denise. Yeah, and, and please do um, still use the chat function to post your questions and comments. Thanks to those who've already done so. Uh, so the first one, Roisin, is from Kate um, saying, what an absolutely incredible project, um, one I hope to visit at some point. I'm interested to understand a bit more about how Roisin's practice learned about the history and culture associated with the pyramids that went on to inform the design. Did this come from local sources? Was there a specialist team of people giving that kind of input for you to, to access? Um, well, we obviously had access to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Uh, we also had um, a museology team. Um, we worked with Cultural Innovations, who are based in London, but um, they had connections with uh, the our, our Egyptologist was uh, Egyptian. Um, I mean, 
you know, when we were designing the museum, obviously the uh, the uh, curators and were were involved. Our people in the Egyptian Museum were involved in some way. So there was we had the benefit of all of that information. And I have to say, I I would say we. We, we started out here and gradually we, we started to have a, a better understanding of, of the history. But, uh, you know, um, we, uh, there were a lot of exhibition designers involved as well. So for us, we also had to accept that this museum needed to be open enough to allow different people to interpret that history that we we could only impose so much on it yes yeah okay thank you um and then the the next question is about scale so the huge scale of the pyramids as well as that great expanse of four thousand years that you mentioned in time spanning the artifacts themselves that will be housed in the museum uh, must have been quite a major driver in and of itself to the design response was this sense of scale a part of the ideas competition brief or was it more from within your own studio's creative process? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I think actually maybe I'd have to go back to the original competition brief to see if it was there. It was something that was very strong for us because we almost had a very cursory you know when we started doing the project we st we started to just look at these timelines and it was suddenly like it was like oh my god how do you how do you communicate this you know i had no idea there was this scale so um i think we definitely felt strongly about it i'm not sure that the competition brief did as much because it went into a lot more detail on the different elements but i do also know sometimes when i go back and reread it i realize that actually we had picked up some more things there than we were maybe fully conscious of at the time does that make sense yeah okay thank you and now we've got a slightly more technical question from a services engineer saying were there any particular methods that had to be taken to protect the building against the desert and saying i, su I suppose i'm thinking of Sandstorms, maybe. Sand, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, well, sand was a big issue. Um, so I am not going to be able to speak to specifically about anything about the services, I'm afraid. Um, we did have to, we did carry out some trials on roofing materials. Uh, to see how they would hold up. We carried out quite a lot of studies on the, the stone facade, did uh, accelerated testing on that to see how that would work. That was maybe more UV rather than sand. We had to develop, you know, systems clearly of clearing the sand off the roofs uh, because because of that wind that you get in the autumn and we're just beside the, the desert. Um, you know, there there had to be a fairly easily maintainable way of dealing with it, but I wouldn't be able to speak too much to the services. Thank you, Roisin. Um, and now a question about the space itself, and I suppose the uses of those spaces. So creating the space to protect and conserve artifacts themselves, as well as showcasing them, uh, must also have been a design factor. So how did you respond to that variety of needs within the, the spaces that you've um, that was a very important element to uh, have um, an, a, a secure space environmentally. So the building is is quite heavy, uh, so it's a concrete structure. The light is very controlled. It's all north facing. Um, it's obviously very heavily insulated. I mean that that was probably the most important element in the design that the um, that the building would be quite slow thermally to respond if there was a change in condition. So one of the things that we always needed to factor in was that there would be a loss of power. Uh, there is a backup generator, uh, but it's, you know, it can, I think it's maybe 
I can't remember, but you know, the maximum would be a day. So if there was a loss of power, the building needed to very, very slowly acclimate. Um, so I, that was a lot of it. It was, and, and there were consequences for the roof because the roof has these quite large spans and in a way from a pure structural point of view steel would have been a material that probably made more sense but thermally because the galleries were directly under the roof it was we really needed to have a concrete roof so that you know that then drove a whole lot of the the design around the galleries okay thank you so much um, we're hearing some some really positive messages as well. So a great project, shame about some of those changes after your involvement, nevertheless, it must be great to see the progress, um, this fundamental good work that's coming to, to fruition now and just seeing some of those more recent photographs of, of it going up. Um, so what are your thoughts, obviously, with that time that's that's gone since the initial ideas competition to now see this that kind of physicality of, of the building taking shape? What are your thoughts? and and feelings about it today um it's i think that uh that the strength of the concept has held up quite well i mean obviously there are some things that we look at and maybe not so much the facade but some of the landscape the the lands of egypt and some of the that idea of the retaining wall you know holding back the desert didn't end up being built uh, according to the design. Um, so maybe a little bit of, oh, that's pity um, about that. But uh, Adrian Gers uh, from West State was out on site maybe a year ago. And um, his view was that um, overall it held up. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So um, don't worry, someone says we, we, we'll all be snagging it when we visit. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, maybe just to conclude, as this is a question from B Senevald, our Director of Projects, who will, Denise will pass over to shortly as well for some reflections. Um, did you use any passive design measures to help control the indoor climate? Um, the, well, the, the passive design, I suppose having this very, um, this heavy box. Uh, we we designed it so that the stair, the uh, entrance space were all open spaces. So it was just natural airflow. So what we were trying to do as much as possible was reduce the amount of controlled spaces that were within the museum because it's, it's a huge museum and just the amount of um you know uh equipment and the cost of, uh, of controlling everything was was a consideration um ultimately the range of control in these permanent galleries did require a mechanical system but we just tried to loosen the range as much as possible and have um and I suppose reduce the demand on the systems by making sure that the envelope was was performing, um, you know, as as hard as possible. Like really trying to reduce the amount of heat gain within the space. Um, but I I think our our passive principles were reduce reduce the amount of space that needs to be conditioned and and try to use air movement and water in other spaces and then having a very uh, good envelope design and, and be fairly robust as well, you know, not have too many very sophisticated systems because that also comes with its own maintenance requirements and, um, yeah, demands. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Roisin. I'm going to pass back now to Denise. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. That's fascinating, uh, Roisin. I mean, what, one point that struck me is that, you know, this was many, many years ago, 18 years ago, the competition was won. And yet I still think that some of the 
the fundamental principles of the design, um, the uh, notion of the, the layering, the relationship with landscape, uh, and the use of axes is still something that is a very, very important aspect of your, your current work. It just seems to me that is actually one of the, the distinguishing features um, of your, your approach to design. Do you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we learned a lot through this project. Uh, and I think that um, those elements that were put in place, they're kind of themes that we have continued to work with. I think in the Palestinian Museum, uh, we were able to push some of them a little bit farther, not obviously on the scale of the Egyptian museum, but, um, and in other projects, but yes, you're absolutely right. Yes. I mean, it, it's such an important aspect because I think it's one of those things as architects that we actually feel that, you know, we, we've been kind of trained within a, a modern idiom that we actually want to take the, the concept all the way through to the smallest detail. Uh, and to actually have the, the facility to do so um, is, is a great pleasure. Um, and actually, it, it, I think it enhances the visits to buildings that we make that many, many people won't see. Although I think there are, as I said earlier, a lot of people are going to be doing a lot of the snagging for you. <laughs> great. Um, I can't help but think though that the, uh, the totality is going to more than, than outweigh any of those very, very small. <laughs> So I'd like to, to thank you very, very much. And I'm sure everyone else um, really enjoyed this great kind of stimulating and insightful talk. 